Good morning, family. Uh, I'm going to be reading um, John chapter 4. It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samarian woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us this well, and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and, not, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our father worshipped in the mountain, in, in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship, uh, you worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When the one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all the, all the things that I have done. This is, not, this is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans come, uh, came to him, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for our ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Thank you. Thanks. Well done. That's a long passage. I was going back and forth all week. I was like, how much do I want to ask of Eli to read? And ended up, was like, hey, you know what? He can do it. I believe in him. And he did a great job. So thank you. I'm going to trip over this. I'm going to move this a little bit. So as you heard, we're reading The Woman at the Well. And we're going to spend the next two weeks, this Sunday and next Sunday, talking about this interaction. This Sunday, we're going to look at specifically Jesus and the woman at the well. And next Sunday, uh, the verses that he skipped over are the disciples. They come back after the interaction, and they have some interesting thoughts. And, some, and Jesus has a great teaching for us. So next week, we'll look at Jesus and the disciples in this interaction. So this morning, though, we are looking at Jesus and the woman at the well which is one of the most famous interactions that Jesus has in all of Scripture. Now, on the heels of having a conversation with a well-known, important, really highly educated Pharisee named Nicodemus, Jesus has this conversation with a nobody, with a woman who we don't even get her name, just a woman who came 
to this well. Now, in normal society, as we will talk about, Jesus should have avoided her, but he didn't. Jesus approached this woman, and he had a conversation with her. And this is a pretty straightforward and simple conversation, but what we're going to see is profound and powerful. What we're going to see is the gospel is for everybody. The gospel is for everybody that we come across with. But we have to be willing to bring our sin and our shame to him in order to truly be free from guilt and shame and to experience his peace. So let's pray and we will dive in. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray as we look at this interaction this morning that you speak to us through your word, that we, our hearts are open, our, we have ears to hear what you have for us this morning. Thank you for this interaction. Thank you that you approached this woman and had a conversation that we can learn so much from thousands of years later. We love you, Lord. I pray you hide me behind the cross and that you speak this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we start by hearing that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Verse 4 says he had to pass through. Right before this, you read that Jesus went from Judea, which is in the south, to Galilee is where he's going, which is in the north. And if I were to show you a map, what you would see is Samaria situated right in the middle. So in one sense, he had to pass through Samaria because it's on his way. But in another sense, he could have avoided it. Really, devout Jews in that time would have actually taken a really long route. They would have gone all the way over to the Jordan River and walked up that way to avoid even walking into Samaria. We talked about this in the last couple weeks. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. It wasn't just uh, sort of, oh, I don't really like them. No, they hated each other. Jews looked at Samaritans as impure half-breeds from their time in exile when Jews intermarried with Gentiles and had these kids and they saw them impure half-breeds, super degrading. But Samaritans looked at Jews and were like, you guys are jerks. You're holier than thou, know-it-all jerks who don't have it as much together as you think you do. And so there was just conflict between the two groups. And even if you didn't take the long route around Samaria, you would try to time your travels to make sure you didn't have to talk to a Samaritan. That's what a good Jew would do. But what's Jesus do? No, he, he goes right to the heart of it, and he has a, a mission. He has a woman that he needs to talk to. And so it says, had to pass through Samaria. And in a sense, that's practical. But in another sense, that's providential. And what I mean by that word is, God the Father had a plan for God the Son. God the Son had something he needed to accomplish with that journey. He had to talk to this woman. He had to be in Samaria. At that point, Jesus is tired. Verse 6, Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And you read in verse 8, the disciples have gone to get food. Last week, as a side note, I made a, a point. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. And so I made this point that Jesus is God. He claims to be God. He is the divine. Well, this week I want to make the opposite emphasis. Jesus was also fully human. He wasn't pretending to be human. No, he, he got tired. He got thirsty. He got hungry. If he wasn't fully human, this journey would have been no problem for him. It would have said something like, and the disciples were tired. Obviously Jesus wasn't. No, it said Jesus was tired. And so he sat down for a rest. And at this time, when he sits down for a rest, he meets the woman. And right away, we as the reader, we're supposed to notice a few things about this woman. Three things in particular. We're supposed to notice her gender. We're supposed to notice her ethnicity. And we're supposed to notice her circumstances. So first, her gender. Pretty obviously, she's a woman. It's what it says, pretty plain as day. In that day, in that society, Jesus, being a man, would have had no dealings with a woman out in public. The only time you would approach a woman in public is if you already had a relationship with her. If she was already part of your family, if you knew her, then maybe you can have the conversation. But just someone you don't know, big no-no. Red flag number one, strike one. 
Number two, we notice her ethnicity. It says she's a woman from Samaria. I already mentioned Jews and Samaritans. Nope. They didn't talk. They didn't like each other. They hated each other. And so not only was she a woman, but she was a Samaritan woman. Red flag number two, strike number two, Jesus, don't talk to her. And then we notice her circumstances. And inside her circumstances, we notice three things. First, verse six, it says it's about the sixth hour. Now, that's not how we keep time anymore. So what does six hour mean? It means around noon. And so that is the hottest part of the day in the desert in the Middle East. In that time, when you would go to a well to get water, you would go in the cool of the morning. You would never go at noon because it's hard. Getting water was hard work. The jars were heavy, especially when they were full of water. If anybody's a runner or even likes to walk or take their bikes out, you don't go at one in the afternoon in the middle of July. You go at 7 a.m. It's a much nicer experience. And some of you are like, running at 7 a.m. is also just as awful for the record. But that's beside the point. If you're going to do it, you go in the cool of the morning. This woman, right in the middle of the day, sun beating down on her. The second thing we notice is she's alone. Again, in that time, she would have never traveled alone. It was very dangerous, especially for women. But she's all by herself. She's at, at noon. She's all by herself. There are so many dangers that could happen. And the third one, this is a little bit harder to see, but it tells us she's from Samaria and Jesus is in a village outside the city. Most likely, there was other wells she could have gone to. Wells that would have been much more convenient, especially at noon. But instead, at noon, by herself, she goes outside the city to go get this water. Strike three, Jesus. Do not approach this woman. She clearly is an outcast. She clearly has something wrong with her, not just the fact that she's a Samaritan, not just the fact that she's a woman, but even her own people don't like her. There's something about her that's causing her to avoid people and people to avoid her. So Jesus, do not approach her. But that's not the way of Jesus. And we're going to continue in this conversation, but I want to make a point here. We're called to have the same attitude as Jesus. We are called to not avoid people. We live in a very divided society right now, whether it's politically, racially, anything. There there are so many things that people want to say, here's our dividing line. Do not approach people in this camp. That don't even broach those conversations. And maybe even not, not those macro levels, but in a micro level. We avoid people we find annoying. We avoid people that we know are just very against our faith. And so we're like, what's the point? When we approach them, they're just going to spit it back in our face. They're not going to have the conversation. What's the point? But Jesus says, no, we, you're supposed to go to the person that you want to avoid. Uh, the book of James, he writes this, religion that is pure and undefiled Before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Jesus commands that we go to the people we're not supposed to. We approach those people, even if they don't want us to approach them. That's often true, right? And they may even be surprised. How could you, a Christian, approach me? You know I'm, insert the blank here, You know, I know you're conservative. You know I'm a Democrat. Or maybe the opposite. Maybe you struggle the opposite way. I know you're a Democrat. I'm a Republican. You don't approach me. You know they're LGBTQ. You know that they're pro-choice. You know, and you could go on and on and on. And Jesus says, yeah, you should should approach that person. You should spend time with that person. You should get to know that person. Ask them about their lives. Serve them. Love them. Now, one of the things that might happen when we do that, is they might be surprised. This woman sure is. Verse 9, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, a woman of Samaria? Jesus has asked her, hey, can you get me some water? And she's like, where are the cameras? Why are you asking me? Like, you know you're a Jewish man, right? And you know I'm a Samaritan woman. And you can look around and see I'm alone and it's at noon. Why are you approaching me? That is a 
a great conversation or a great question. And Jesus uses this moment to start a deep conversation, probing into her life with the purpose of revealing to her the truth. And the truth is this, and it's true for all of us. We all have a great need, but we have a greater Savior for our need. And, G- and Jesus is about to show this woman her need and her need for a Savior. And what's ironic about this circumstance is if she thought she was okay, if she thought she was this good, moral person, she would have never met Jesus that day. She would have totally missed out on the opportunity if she thought she had it all together. Because if she thought she had it all together, she would have been there five hours earlier. She wouldn't have been alone. And yet, because she knew that she was broken, because she knew that there was something missing, she got to meet Jesus. So many of us miss our opportunity to, miss, er, to meet Jesus because we think we have it all together. But once we recognize that we need a Savior, if you're not a Christian, this is for you in particular, once we recognize that, then we can truly meet Jesus. Because Jesus came to save sinners. We live in a culture that we all think we're really independent, good, moral people. So I don't, I don't need a Savior. This woman shows us that once we truly know our need and we're truly open to a Savior, then we can truly live without shame. And that's what we're going to get to. So next we're going to see that Jesus makes this offer. Verses 10 through 12, Jesus and this woman have this back and forth. Basically, it boils down to she's like, give me a drink. And she's like, you shouldn't be asking me. And he's like, you're right. You should be asking me. And then she asks a pretty straightforward question. Why would I ask you for water? You don't even have a bucket. How are you supposed to get water without a bucket? And Jesus flips it back to this, what he calls living water. Look in verse 13. He says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. On the surface, this is very straightforward. If you drink water, no matter how good of a glass of water it is, you will be thirsty again. That's pretty standard biology, right? We can agree to that. No matter how good of a meal you eat, just a few hours later, you're going to be hungry again. That is how our bodies work. But Jesus obviously is saying something deeper. He's pointing to the fact that we all look for satisfaction in the wrong well. This woman is looking for satisfaction in the wrong well. And so my question for all of us is, what well do we go to? I think in our culture, there's, there's three main wells that we all typically go to. And what I want to invite you to do as we, as we talk through these three wells is, I want you to have some introspection. Look at your life. What well do I go to? I think the first well that we typically go to is relationships and sex, right? We want to be filled by whatever our need is, whether you're married or not married, you, you treat your spouse like they're the savior. And if you're not married, your need is, I have to be with someone. Maybe you're unfulfilled and so you run to things you shouldn't, right? Relationships and sex, I think that's the first well. The second well I think that we can run to is comfort. That can look in many different ways. Maybe that looks like a lot of credit card debt. Maybe that looks like... Uh, having to keep up with people and not be as generous as maybe you should be because you are so concerned with being comfortable. Maybe Jesus is calling you to go serve in a certain community in a certain way and you're like, oh, I don't wanna wanna do that. That's dangerous or that's unsafe. And so we're worried about our comfort. And I think the third well is recognition or admiration. We love when people give us applause. And so what that might look like is maybe we're dishonest. Maybe we, we perform for the applause of other people, which is exhausting. And so I want you to just think about those three wells. And if you're taking notes, I, I invite you to write down which of those three wells you typically run to. And as you do that, I want you this week to tell someone, which well do you go to? I want you to have a conversation with maybe a, a trusted friend, your spouse. If you're in a discipleship relationship, talk to that person. And say, hey, Pastor Brady asked us to write this down. Here's the well that I run to. 
can we pray about this? Can you help keep me accountable in this? And we're, we'll get to this, but she clearly is running to that first well. Relationships and sex is clearly where she's looking for satisfaction. And in this, Jesus makes an extraordinary offer. He says that he has water that will cause a person to never be thirsty again. This person who drinks this water won't ever have a need again. They won't have to come out to the well anymore. Now, what's Jesus saying here? Is he saying that once you're a Christian, that all of your financial desires and wants will be met? There are some that would teach that. There are people that teach this false gospel. It's called the prosperity gospel, where they say, that the more spiritual you are, the more holy you are, the closer to God you are, the more rich you become. The more God will take care of your needs. I, to put color to this, I want to read you some of their quotes. This is, they use passages like this to teach us that God wants this for us. They want, God wants us to be rich and to be healthy above all. This is one of them. His name's Benny Hinn. He says, God will begin to prosper you for money always follows righteousness. Poverty comes from hell. Prosperity comes from heaven. Joel Osteen says this, God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money to fulfill the destiny he laid out for us. Kenneth Copeland puts it this way, you get spiritually rich and you'll get financially rich. If you hear that, run. That is not the teachings of Scripture. Although there's passages, it says in the Bible, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. He says living water and you'll never be thirsty again. You'll never have a want or a desire again. What is He referring to? Well, what He's referring to is when we become Christian, God gives us a new heart. He reorders our desires. So our desires stop being the things of this world our desires start being, I want to look more like Jesus. I want the Father's will above all. We see this most plainly in Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before he is betrayed, before he is crucified, he prays this in Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. You see his ultimate desire there? What is the desire of his heart? That God the Father's will is done. So we can have the, hey, God, I would like to not be sick anymore. God, I, and we, we bring those things to our Father, and he cares for us, and he listens to us. But ultimately, the desire that he fills in our heart, the living water that he gives us, fulfills that thirst. The thirst of, I want to honor the Lord. The thirst of, I need someone who can save me, who can give me peace, who can make me whole, who can give me joy, who can accept me and love me. That is what we need. That is what the living water is. Imagine being this woman in this conversation. Based solely on what we know from observation, she clearly doesn't want to be seen by people. And perhaps what she hears in this conversation is she's finally going to be able to hide. I'm never going to have to come to the well anymore. I'm never going to have to come outside and happen to see those people who know my shame. I'm never going to have to look my shame in the face again. I can just avoid my shame. That sounds great. Can I have some of that? Of course she's going to take that. This woman's going to say yes because she knows her need and she kind of wants that bandage. But Jesus is going to pry deeper. Now, when we, when we look at our culture, if you ever go to, sometimes they're bigger churches, but a lot of churches, what they'll have on their bulletin is this, this back where they can, you can check different things. And one of the things you can check is, I've accepted Jesus today. And you know what they do with that information? They share it. They just say, hey, we had 6,000 people this year accept Jesus. And they leave it at that because their job has been done. Jesus, he just got the check mark. The woman said, I'll take living water. Jesus could have gone, sweet, I did it. Job done. But instead, he needs her to do something a little bit more. He needs to draw her out a little bit more. He needs to bring something a little bit more to the table, which leads to the request. Verse 16 through 18. 
Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now at first glance, what Jesus does here is shocking and we almost think it's rude, right? Think about being in a conversation. If you're in a conversation and you're a salesman and you're like, here, I would like to sell you this. And they say, sure, I would like the product. And you say, hey, you know that thing that you're most ashamed about? Can we talk about that now? First of all, you lose the sale. And second of all, you end the conversation. So why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus go, hey, you should go get your husband? Because he, he clearly knows what he's asking. He says that and she's like, I, I don't have one. And he's like, I, I know. You've had five. And you're actually living now with a guy who's not even your husband. And the reason Jesus does this is because Jesus isn't a salesman. He's a savior, which is different. Our goal when telling people about Jesus isn't to get notches on our belt and say, we sold the gospel. No, our goal is that people know the real Jesus. Jesus handles the results. And as, as I mentioned before, she clearly has one of those wells that she's going to. But Jesus needs her to grasp this truth. Matthew 11, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. And so Jesus is saying, hey, I need you to go get your husband. So my question for you this morning is who is your husband? What is that thing that Jesus would look at you and say, go get that? For some of you, and this is going to be a little weighty, but let's speak plainly here. In a room this size, all the stats show that there are several in this room that Jesus might look at you and say, go get your search history. And you would say, Ooh, God, I don't, I don't want you to see that. Jesus would say, no, I need you to bring that to me. Some of you, again, in a room this large, have had experience with abortion. And maybe you've hidden that, you've buried that. And Jesus says, go get your son, your daughter. And you say, I, I can't. Jesus says, I know. Some of you, maybe you're just dishonest. And we've lied on taxes. We've, we've lied at work and done things that we shouldn't have done. And Jesus is like, hey, go get your tax return. And you're like, no, I, I can't. That's, that's back here. And Jesus is like, no, I, I need that. And maybe what you have, maybe your husband is not quite that extreme. Maybe it's a mistake that you've made back in the day, back when you were younger and you've tried to bury that. Maybe it's the way that you're behaving at home. Maybe you have an anger issue. Maybe, maybe whatever it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know what Jesus would say to you. I know what he would say to me. And he would say, go get that. I need that. We often avoid those things because we think avoiding it's the easiest route. But if we want to truly heal, we have to truly repent and face it. Nancy Guthrie author and Bible teacher in her book, God Does His Best Work with Empty, he, she puts it this way. No doubt the words of this man at the well sent a surge of shame through this woman, but he wasn't trying to shame her. He was trying to help her see the thirst in her life that was even more significant than her physical thirst. She was thirsty to be known and loved, thirsty for life the way God originally intended it to be. She had an unquenchable thirst to be satisfied beyond a moment of pleasure, to be accepted and nurtured and cherished. And here stood Jesus, offering her the water that would quench the inner thirst that all her relationships had been unable to satisfy. I don't know what your well is. I don't know what Jesus would say to you individually. But I beg of you to go get it. I beg of you to bring it to Jesus. 
And I beg of you to have conversations with people about it. Say, hey, this is, this is the thing. This is what I'm afraid to bring forward. And start to work through repentance and healing because in the gospel, we can be healed. And if we don't truly experience that healing, we'll never truly experience the peace and joy that Jesus offers. If you're not a Christian, I want to invite you right now to truly lay your burden on him, repent of your sin, and trust in him. There is only one place where true satisfaction and true thirst quenching can actually happen, and that is at the cross of Jesus, where he took your sin, your shame, and he killed it. It died along with him. He lived the life that we should have lived, and he died the death we deserve to die. And then three days later, he rose from the grave victorious, defeating death, sin, hell, and the grave once and for all. All you have to do is come to him. And if you're a Christian, remember that. Remember that truth. And that thing that you're hiding, the thing you think he can't see, bring it to him. Because that is how we truly experience healing. This woman, she does what a lot of us would do when we feel exposed. She dodges. A really quick and clever dodge. She's like, hey, let's talk about theology. You seem like you're a prophet. You guys, Jewish people, you have a temple. We have a temple. Crazy, right? Which one's the right temple? And I appreciate it because I feel like in that moment, I would do the exact same thing. I don't know what your dodge would be when you feel exposed, but we all, we all kind of do that. And Jesus follows her dodge. Remember last week, we talked about Nicodemus and how he met Nicodemus where he was. He meets this woman where she is. And so he, he indicates to her that she needs to know him rightly, right? We need to worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. We have to love the Lord our God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In order to do that, we have to know the one who is that? We have to know the truth. We have to know the way in order to take the way. If I invite you to my house and I tell you you have to drive on Melvin Road, if you can't recognize Melvin Road, you never make it to Melvin Road, you'll never make it to my house because you have to drive on Melvin Road to get to my house. Jesus is the same way. In order to make it to God, you have to go by the way, the only way. And so we have to know him rightly. And to know him rightly means to know him in spirit and in truth. It means that we are in his word. It means we are coming to church. It means we're in small groups and in community together, studying his word and getting to know him rightly and truly. And who is this God? Well, he is the creator God, the God who has wrath against sin, the God who loves justice, the God who is jealous for his own glory because that is the ultimate good in this world. But he's also grace. God is also love, rich in mercy, abounding in steadfast love, who will forgive all of your sin because of the work of Jesus on the cross as long as you come to him. That is who our God is, and I pray that you know him rightly, you get to know him rightly. And if you get to parts of Scripture, I want to invite you if, you, if you struggle with studying Scripture on your own, get plugged in with other people. Say, I need help understanding this. Find good books. Find good podcasts. Go to things like The Bible Project. Find an elder or a leader here at this church. We would love to help you out and work through these things together. Our culture kind of has tried to take the bite out of who God is. We try to make him more easy for us to accept things that we don't want to know or things that we disagree with, th truths that we're like, I'd rather that not be true. We just wash over those. The previous church I was at, I'll never forget, there was an email that was sent to the church and this woman in this email said, hey, I would like to get married at your church and I would like if you all helped us out and she would like to get married to what she hoped would be her wife. And in the email, this is what she said. I know what the Bible says, but I think God would be happy with this. That's what we are, that's our culture right now. Is we say, look, I know God is wrath and love. I don't like the wrath stuff. Look, I know God has, a, has an order for our marriages and our lives. 
I don't like that, so here, let's broaden it because that seems nicer. No, we have to know who God is. And that's what Jesus is telling her in these verses. You worship what you don't know. We're worshiping what we know. You need to know God rightly. And she's starting to get the hint, and she asks this question, or she makes this statement, and it's a question that's underneath it. She says this in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. It's kind of this desperation. I know I need, I know I need the Messiah. Is it you? I, is this you? Are, you? are you who I'm thinking you might be? Please say yes, because I need the Messiah. You know what's going on in my life. You know I need the Christ. You know how much I need you. And Jesus responds in verse 26, I who speak to you am he. Now she's already been exposed. She has brought her darkest secret. She has brought her sin. And we finish up here. We see the result. Verse 28 through 30, she leaves her water jar, goes back to the town, says to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. First thing is she leaves her jar. It's like the whole reason she was at the well was to get water. Something more amazing happens, so she just forgets about that whole situation. She forgets about that, and she's like, yeah, I don't, I don't need this right now. I have something better I need to do. And what's amazing is she's experienced this true healing. Think about this woman. This is a woman who has felt so much shame that she is avoiding people at all costs. The people in the Samaritan village, those are the people who you can imagine. She goes back into town and says, hey, I have something I need to tell you. And they go, but aren't you that woman? And she's like, yeah, he knew it already. He knew that about me. This is the Christ. You should come meet him. When we truly are healed, that's the result. The result is that we're able to go back to the things that used to cause us shame. People might poke at it and be like, but aren't you that person who, and you're like, yeah, I am, and he forgave it. You should come meet him. Isn't it amazing? While my, my title, my identity used to be liar, hypocrite, addict, whatever it may be, I don't know, again, you could have whatever label that you have. You have all these things on you, and you're like, yeah, Jesus knew that. Maybe your labels that you're so proud of might be, I'm awesome. I'm successful. I'm wealthy. I'm a good parent. I'm a good spouse. Pro and con. That used to be me. You know who I am now? Forgiven. Child of God. Beloved. That woman had so many names. You can imagine in her village, right? I'm sure people were like, you know what happened to husband number three, right? <laughs> Adulterer. Liar. Unclean. Sinner. That died. Her new identity was forgiven, loved, child of God. Our culture wants to talk about all these identities. What's the most important thing about you? The only true identity, the only identity that brings us peace is that. The only identity that brings us true joy and peace is that. And then Jesus looks at you and you know how he labels you? Righteous. And maybe, maybe you have one of those things that you're like, I... I'm not righteous. You don't know what I've done. Jesus says, mm -mm, you're righteous. I need you to bring that to me because that's not who you are. Who you are is my righteous child who I have died for. We must accept that. And to truly accept that, we must really bring him our stuff. We must bring him our junk and then he will heal us and he will love us, he will accept us, and we will be part of a family. And this change makes a difference. So she goes to the Samaritan, she goes to all these people that used to talk behind her back, and what do they do? They notice. They're like, oh, wow, look at, 
Look at this woman that used to be, and who we know as, that's amazing. And they come out and meet Jesus. And then a switch happens. Look in verses 41 and 42. They said to the woman, or 42, sorry, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So it starts with seeing her testimony, seeing how her life has changed, brings them to Jesus, and then they hear the words of Jesus, and then they're like, you got us here, but Jesus has saved us. And now we believe because we've heard his word. So maybe what happens in your life is you truly heal, we truly heal, and we go out and we share the love of Christ. We share how Jesus has changed our lives, and people are like, I would like to check out how this change happened in your life. They come to church with you, or maybe they go to a Bible study with you, and you open up God's word, and they're like, hey, it was because of your life that got me here, but then I heard the words of Jesus, and now I'm saved. Now I know the peace and the hope and the joy of the Lord. And isn't that what we all truly want? Friends, Jesus' invitation goes out to us all. Whether you're a moral, highly educated, important Jewish leader like Nicodemus, or whether you're a nobody, no-name, sinful woman, or anything in between, the invitation for Christ goes to everyone. It's a wide net. And so we are supposed to go out and cast that net. So again, the question is, the invitation is to go and get your husband. Whatever your husband is, and bring it to Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us we cast everything on Jesus. Why? Because he cares for us. He cares for you. So you can cast everything whatever your junk is on him. Because he cares for you. He loves you, and he accepts you, and he will change you and heal you. Let's pray. Lord, I confess I far too often go to the wrong well. I go to a well that I think will satisfy. I go to a well that I think will give me meaning and identity. And it leaves me empty, Lord. It leaves me unsatisfied. Lord, give us all the courage and the faith to continually go to the well that leaves us completely satisfied. The well that quenches all of our thirst. Lord, if there's a person in here who is, who is hiding shame in their life, they, they struggle to believe the words of Paul in Romans 8, that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, I pray right now that you comfort them, that you wrap your arms around them, and you let them know that they can bring you anything. You cannot out the grace of God, and I pray that people know that, that they know that your blood was shed so that way we may be forgiven. Lord, we worship you and we love you. We thank you for the work of Jesus on the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.